Well, I've said that. I'm ready to preach tonight. <laughs> Judges chapter 17. I'm looking around tonight. I'm trying to figure out, is there anybody here so spiritual? You are so spiritual. You have walked so close to God for so long that you get a pass on the Word of God. Is there anybody like that? But there are people who think they are. That somehow they get a pass on this passage, that passage, that passage. They had the same problem in Israel. This is not a new problem. It's an old problem. And we're going to read this passage tonight in chapter 17, although the story does cover two chapters. It covers chapter 17 and chapter 18. It's the household of Micah, the Ephraimite. And you look at this particular passage... And you get an idea of what home life was like during the time of the judges. And after you read this, you have a clear understanding of why God sent judgment upon His people during this time. And I believe it gives us an insight into why Samson was like he was, brought up in his society. There were things he should have known better then, and to be sure, Samson did not get a pass. I mean, you look at him with his eyes gouged out, with all that he failed in, how he had to die, all of that. You say, he sure didn't get a pass. Because I don't care how wicked the society is or how wicked the culture is, God still wants his people to make decisions according to his word. So notice this story, beginning in chapter 17 of the book of Judges. And there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he sent unto his mother... The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest and spakest of also in mine ears, behold, the silver is with me, I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou the Lord, my son. Now don't you have to smile just a little bit there? Smile or cry. Can this be so? A boy confesses to stealing from his mother a great deal of money. 1,100 pieces of silver. And by the way, a little bit later in this story, a Levite priest is willing to take 10 pieces for an annual salary. This guy has 1,100 that he stole from his mom, and his mom says, Blessed be thou the Lord. But it gets weirder. And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord. Notice that's Jehovah. From my hand, from my son, to make a graven image, a, gra a graven image and a molten image, now therefore I will restore it unto thee. Did, did we read that right? She had dedicated it to the Lord to do what? It says, yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of silver. And gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image. And they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a house of gods and made an ephod and teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. In those days there was no king in Israel. But every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, the family of Judah, who was a Levite and he sojourned there. And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he, as he journeyed. And Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me. Be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year, and a suit of apparel, and thy victuals. So the Levite went in, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man. The young man was unto him as one of his sons. And Micah consecrated the Levite, the young man became his priest, and was in the house of Micah. Then said Micah, Now know I that the Lord, notice again it's Jehovah, will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. Now, Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Lord, these... These are amazing verses. To think that any of your people could be so warped as to think that any of this might possibly be right in the light of what you've 
said just in the first six books of the Bible. But Lord, I pray tonight that you would instruct us, you would con convict us, convince us, and make us a people who decide in our lives and in our homes that we're going to hold up the Word of God as right and anything that differs is wrong. And Lord, we'll thank you for what you do in our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, we just finished our study in the book of Samson. We saw the mess and all of that. And by the way, from the first of Judges, where you see God's people not fulfilling God's Word, and you have the basic outline of the book given for us in chapter 2, when he told us what would happen, the people would forsake the Lord God of Israel to follow the gods of the people that were still around them that they had not wiped out. And then God would bring a group like the Midianites in to put them under oppression for a number of years. And then God would send a judge in to get them out from underneath the oppression. And then the people soon after that would go right back into the same old sin and the cycle would repeat with another oppressor, maybe the Amalekites this time or another group, the, uh, uh, any of them that would come in, and they would take those and again there would have to be a judge come in to get them out and as soon as that got done taking place, a couple of years had passed and they'd be right back in the same mess again. Well, we get to these last five chapters of this book and we really have a good look inside the nation, even into an individual family, which evidently is a family that is representative of what the rest of the families in Israel was like at that time. Do you realize that there are only four times in the Bible where you have the words, there was no king in Israel? All four of them are in these last five chapters of the book of Judges. The first one we read in chapter 17 and verse 6. We see it again in chapter 18 and verse 1, and again in chapter 19 and verse 1. Then finally, in the last verse of the book, 21, 25, you find that statement again. And what he's telling us is that when the people of God didn't have somebody to tell them what to do, they did what was right in their own eyes, but what was right in their own eyes was wrong in the eyes of God. That's why God had to bring judgment upon them. And of course, in this particular story, we're talking about a family that lived in Ephraim, which was right in the very center, in the very heart of the promised land. So we're not talking about being out on the fringes, like, of course, uh, we know Samson was raised up right on the border between the Philistines and Israel, just three miles from Timnath, Timnath, the Philistine town. But we're talking about a family that was right in the heart of Israel. And for an explanation, he tells us in verse 6, And in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. They were a lot like Christians today who are simply doing what is right in their own eyes. I do believe that there are numbers of believers who are not doing wrong in their own eyes. They're doing right in their own eyes. But according to the Word of God, what is right in their eyes is wrong in the eyes of God. I got news for you. God doesn't give you a pass for doing right in your own eyes. Israel didn't get a pass for doing right in their own eyes. It is obedience to the Word of God that is commanded. So we look at this family in the heart of Israel. It is a family that are like so many of our churches and so many of our people today. We have God's prescription for life right here. It is His recipe for us. Now, the recipes are wonderful things. But you realize that you can take the same medicine, the same ingredients in a medicine that can cure, if they're put in in the wrong dosage, that same medicine will kill. You could take some milk and some flour and some lard, and you can make some great biscuits. But you put them in there in the wrong amount, and they're going to be some nasty taking, tasting things. You understand what I'm saying? Now, God's given us the right recipe for life in His Word. The Bible says this in Proverbs 16, 2, All the ways of man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Some of the nonsense that you read about that's going on in churches today, 
some of the nonsense that's going on in families today, those families are not sitting there saying, how can I disobey the Word of God? When they tell you they don't see what's wrong with it, they're not lying to you. They don't see what's wrong with it. They're doing what is right in their own eyes. They treat God's Word like a book of suggestions. The home of Micah is one of those homes. His story covers two full chapters, but we're going to cover basically the things that take place in chapter 17. I want you to notice, first of all, the wrong ways of man. Now, I've got two points to this message, but there are 20 sub-points under each point. So, the wrong ways of man. First of all, clear disobedience to the commands of God. Verse 3, it says, And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord. Now, you know, every time you see in the Old Testament the word Lord in all capitals, it is always the word Jehovah. I believe God led the King James translators to designate that for us, and it's very important in a lot of doctrine, by the way. So she's dedicated this, this silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son. Now that's an odd way to put it. To the Lord for my son, but it gets worse, to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, what's she doing in her sight? Right. It seems spiritual to her. And yet the Word of God said in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 4, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Now she says, I have wholly, wholly dedicated this silver unto the Lord. And what she's doing with that silver is exactly what God commanded them not to do. But she doesn't see what's wrong with it. Matter of fact, she thinks she's being spiritual. Do you understand what I'm saying tonight? I'm, I'm, I'm not yelling at her. I'm, I'm not mad at her. I, this poor woman has deluded herself. She's not open. She's not in your face like the heathen are in Psalm 2, shaking their fist at God, saying, we'll not have this man to rule over us. No, that, that's, that's not her. She's doing what seems right in her own eyes. As far as she was concerned, she was simply doing good. For instance, Leviticus 18.20, the Bible says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is abomination. Do you know if you were to take a survey of conservative churches in America, that which are those they still would preach the gospel, you'd find a great number of people who see nothing wrong or see homosexuality as simply a life choice where there's nothing that wrong with it. I'm, talking, I'm not talking about the liberals that deny everything about the Bible. But they've done surveys of young people in conservative churches and young people growing up in our churches. Do you right, realize that less than half see that as a sin against God? You say, man, how could they be so twisted? Listen, they're telling you the truth. They see nothing wrong with it. And yet God calls it an abomination. Proverbs 12, 22 says, Lying lips are an abomination. To the Lord. Are they or aren't they? They yes, still are, aren't they? All right, in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, he says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him. And then he mentions six things. He talks about a proud look, a lying tongue, uh, hands that shed innocent blood, and so on, feet to be swift to running to mischief. And then the seventh thing he mentions are those who sow discord among the brethren. Now, six he hates, seven's an abomination. That seventh one is he that sows discord among the brethren. And yet, in most what we would even call Bible-believing churches, the group that sows discord, nobody wants to hurt their feelings, they hover around them and listen to their garbage. But God calls it an abomination. I don't see what's wrong with it. I'm just sharing my opinion. 
Are, are you getting it here? We could go to other verses. For instance, turn to the book of Leviticus. You will be coming back to Judges. Leviticus chapter 18. Interesting chapter. In chapter 18, he's got a number of things he's going to tell them not to do. And over and over again, he's going to close out these verses by saying, I am the Lord thy God. Because he wanted them to know that this wasn't coming from Moses. This was coming from God himself. But after he talks about adultery, nudity, after he talks about incest and interfamily nudity and some real perversions, he then says about all these things in verse 24. Now he's talking to God's people, remember. He says, Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things. For in all these things the nations are defiled which I cast out before you. Hey, people, the reason you're going to get this land is because of their sin. But he, let's stop. He says, and the land is defiled. Now, let me ask you a question before we read any farther and I give away the answer to my question. Will the land be less defiled if God's people do it? I mean, after all, for God's people... It's different for us, isn't it? No, it's not. He says in verse 25, And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, nor any stranger that sojourneth among you, for all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled. That the land spew not you out also when ye defile it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among their people. So God's telling His people Israel, listen, it's for these sins then I'm going to bring you into the land and they're going to be destroyed. And if you commit those things, guess what? I'll throw you out too. You see, it didn't make a difference who did it. If it was an abomination, it's still an abomination. Hmm. If this mother had been as concerned about her children obeying the Lord as she was in simply being religious... She'd have been a lot better mother to this child, Micah. But instead, she's got her own way of worshiping God. And all you need to do is just go to chapter 4 of the book of Genesis and find out what God thinks of people doing things their own way. He accepted Abel's sacrifice, who did it God's way, but did not accept Cain's. And warned Cain when Cain was angry because his way was not accepted by God... He said, doest thou well to be angry? He said, if you'll do right, you'll be accepted, but if not, behold, sin lieth at the door. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. So he was disobedient to the commands of God and thought she was doing right. Next thing, she rewarded wrongdoing. In verse 2, her son comes up and says, oh, all that money, that 1,100 pieces of silver, I took it. Blessed be thou the Lord, my son. Now, <laughs> that's an amazing statement to me, but I'm going to tell you what. I've seen it. This is something that's been going on for centuries here. For instance, you, you go to the grocery store. I hate going to the grocery store. I, I want to go when no mothers are there with their children. Because you go to the grocery store and you see some mother pushing the cart along, and the child sees something they want, whether it's a toy or a particular box of cereal or whatever it is, and saying, I want that. And mother's saying, no, no, we're not going to get that. But mommy, I want it. No, we're not. Just be quiet. We're not going to get that. But I want, no. Now, we're not. Just be quiet. We're not going to take you out and spank you. If you now, but mommy, I want it. Okay, here, take it. And then she wonders why the child can't obey. She has rewarded that child for doing wrong. And the same thing will happen 
the next time she goes to the store because that's what she's teaching her child. But she's going to blame the church or the father or society instead of herself. Child gets disciplined at school. And so mama says, you know, I need them to feel better about themselves. They take them to Chuck E.'s Cheese. Boy, that's a lot different than the way it was when I went to school, Brother Wagner. Man, if I got a whooping at school, I knew I was getting one when I got to the house. At school? And they didn't take you to Chuck E. Cheese? That's amazing. Or daddy whips the parent, and so mama feeling... Or daddy whips the parent. <laughs> well, maybe she needed to be whipped. Daddy whips the child, and so mama feels so bad for the child, she makes the child their favorite supper. I just don't know why kids can't obey like they used to obey. And the problem is parental delinquency. Amen. Amen. She rewarded wrongdoing. Give you a third thing. He had a house of gods. Look in verse 5. The man Micah made an house of gods, made an ephod and teraphim, and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. Now there's a number of things here, but one thing his mama taught him was to be open minded. You know, what a shame to be closed-minded. Now, one of the things you understand about the God of the Bible, He is a jealous God among us. Amen. He warns us about that in Deuteronomy 6.15, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Now, Micah is a guy that even a lot of people in our churches really like because he's really a good guy. He's taking care of a Levite. He's exalting his son spiritually. They're doing a lot of talking about God. They're making sacrifices to God. But what he's doing is in disobedience to God. He's got other gods. He's going to be mad at anybody that's going to run down any other religion at all. Because he's open. Maybe he's just trying to be careful in case he's wrong about who the true God is. He didn't want to anger one who might be the true God. But the point is, he's got other gods. Now, if you've got a God other than the one of the Bible, even if you call him by the same name, then you've got the wrong God. It is the God of the Bible who is God. The one who wrote the Bible is God. Now, I look at this guy, this broad-minded guy. I, can you imagine, now I was just thinking about this as I was preparing the message, could you imagine if Micah would have had the Internet back then and had his own Facebook page? You could have gone to his Facebook page and you would have seen he was over with that teraphim, smiling, holding that teraphim. He is so proud. And then he goes, puts the ephod on, gets a picture taken of him looking sharp and that, you know, leaning up against the uh, banister there, looking sharp with that ephod. Proud! Now wait, he's doing what seems right in his own eyes. He's proud! And I can imagine somebody sending him a little note. That's idolatry. What do you mean calling me an idolater? I worship Jehovah. Who are you to call me? I live as good as you do. He'd let them know right quick that they better not question his spirituality. Yeah, he may be disobeying Exodus chapter 20. That may be true. But he loves God just as much as those people that obey that verse. Folks, I'm going to tell you, the things that we experience in Huntsville and Madison are experienced out of church members all over this country. The brazenness of people to try to push their disobedience to clear commands in the Scripture. But wait! They're not doing what's wrong in their eyes. They're doing what's right in their own eyes. I thought, you know, it's, <laughs> you could say, well, the Bible says in those days there was no king in Israel. And we don't have a king, I understand that, but daddy's supposed to be guarding the home. Daddy's supposed to be setting the standards in the home. Truth is, most daddies don't have a clue what's going on in their own home. 
It's not the pastor's job to know this first. That is job to know this stuff first. That is job to take care of it. Well, I, what's the next step? The next step was he thought he could make his own preacher. Look at verse 5 again. And the man Micah had a house of gods and made an ephod and teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. Wait a second. He was of Ephraim. His son can't be a priest. The priest could only come from Levi. Who does he think he is? He's a guy doing right in his own eyes. He was of Ephraim. Priests were only to come out of the tribe of Levi. And they had to have certain qualifications. By the way, to be a pastor of a church, there are qualifications given in the Word of God. You know, you go to one of those shout meetings a lot of times where preachers get together and, man, they're just shouting amen and screaming, they're having a good time. Nothing wrong with that as long as the right things are being preached. And uh, especially go to one of the camp meetings, it may be like that a lot. And uh, I heard one guy say a long time ago, if you want to get everybody quiet at a camp meeting, you've got two subjects you can preach on. Preach on soul winning and preach on the qualifications of a pastor. It's absolutely amazing to me that in some churches, Brother Borf, they'll actually vote a guy out because the church hasn't grown in the last two years. But if the church has been grown, even if he commits adultery, they'll say, well, let's forgive him and keep him on. And they think they're doing right. You can forgive him all you want. He's still not qualified. Do you understand? Listen, these stories are repeated throughout our society, and they didn't start with us. This guy, making his own preacher, he thought he could do that. Uh, he was not ignorant of God's word, by the way, because when he later gets a Levite, notice what he says in verse 9, Micah said unto him, that's to the Levite, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me, and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year and a suit of apparel and thy victuals. So the Levite went in. Then verse 12, Micah consecrated the Levite. He didn't have the power to do that either, by the way. And the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. And then said Micah, now look at what he says. Now I know, or now know I, that the Lord will do me good. Why? Seeing I have a Levite to my priest. Boy, this guy, his thinking's all really goofed up. Now God's going to... You know what that Levite was to him? That Levite was his good luck charm. And, and that's really all that he was. He wanted a preacher with credentials, without conviction. That Levite should have been the first one and said, Buddy, first of all, I'm not stepping foot in your house till you get rid of your false gods. But you see, he ended up liking those gods himself because when the Danites came down and offered him a bigger job, he took all of Micah's false gods and carried them off with him so the Danites could worship him too. He wanted a preacher with credentials, without convictions. I do believe there are a lot of preachers that hide behind their Greek words and their Hebrew words so that they don't have to preach conviction. Oh, I can explain away. Listen, all right, I had two and a half years of Greek, and I've also taught Greek. Uh, yeah, I, I understand some Greek. But if you know Greek so well that you can undo the English, then, buddy, somebody mistaught you. You don't know it that way. You did a little study, so you found a little Greek word, make you undo the Greek, or find a little Hebrew word, thinks, I got news for you. The guys that translate this Bible, God had prepared. You talk about educated, and nobody holds a candle to them today. These guys were speaking Greek and Hebrew to one another, biblical Greek and Hebrew, when they were five to seven years of age. They didn't wait till they got in seminary and learned it. God was preparing some people to give us our English Bible. Well, so, and by the way, you notice what moved this preacher. You go over to chapter 18 and verse 19 when the Levites offer him a job. It says, And they said unto him, 
hold thy peace, lay thine hand upon thy mouth, and go with us, and be unto us a father and a priest, is it better for thee to be a priest unto the house of one man, or that thou be a priest unto a tribe and a family in Israel? And the priest's heart was glad. And he took the ephod and the teraphim and the graven image and went in the midst of the people. So they turned departed and put the little ones and the cattle and the carriage before them. Yippee! I've got a bigger job. I've been advanced in the work of God. But he wasn't doing the work of God. He went from not doing the work of God with one man to not doing the work of God with a whole tribe in Israel because they were more interested in the credentials. He was a Levite than they were convictions. Think about it, but wait. They were doing what? What was right in their own eyes. That is warped thinking. And the sad part is they don't even realize it. Micah thought he was spiritual when he had that Levi. He thought he was spiritual. He wasn't spiritual at all. You know, it's rough to be self-deceived like that, and we all have to be careful about that. Because the heart is deceitful of all things and desperately wicked who can know it. That's why he tells us, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy paths. Israel didn't get a pass. God took all that. God brought him through Egypt. He took him across the Red Sea. He took him through the wilderness. Kept them for 40 years. Fed them. They got into the land and they disobeyed his word. And after all of God's care, he didn't give them a pass either. And they only had six books of the Bible. Is that not amazing? We've got 66 books of the Bible. Well, that brings me to the second point. Where's the commitment in your home or in your life? You see, we looked at this man, and we saw in this man the wrong ways of man who are simply going by what seems right to them, what seems okay, what they're not offended with. Where's the commitment in your home? What is your standard in your home? For instance, what do you teach about the Word of God? Is it authoritative in your life? Or do you have passages in your Bible that you've simply put a little line around and said, culture, so you don't have to obey it? I don't see what's wrong with it. Things were different back then. See, where are you at? How author is it, does it affect every area of your life? Now, that is a lifelong challenge, by the way, for every one of us. Because we are cumbered about with flesh and because of the deceitfulness of sin, because of the wickedness of the flesh itself, because of the wickedness of the culture that is around us, it is so easy for us to be deceived and to be self-deceived. That's why we've got to be committed to this word. Is it the final mandate as to what you say? Is it the final mandate as to what you do? Is it the final mandate to what work you do? Is it the final mandate to what you wear, or where you go, or what you watch, or what you listen to? Your dealings with other Christians, is it your heart that's going to guide you, or is it the Word of God that's going to guide you? Listen, God wrote very clearly what He meant in the Scripture. People get so wrapped up in their feelings, they have no idea how to act, even in personal situations, because they're doing what's right in their own eyes. Second thing here, what do you teach your family about God? Is your God holy? What does that word mean, holy? I, I'm convinced that we do not do enough meditation, and I'm not talking about transcendental meditation no, I'm not talking about closing your eyes, going, hmm. I'm talking about sitting and thinking about the Word of God. Thinking about the words that God used and what those words mean. Uh, for instance, if you say, well, you know, it doesn't make a difference what you wear. For instance, ladies, you just need to be modest. What does that mean? What does modest mean? Are there scriptural guidelines for modesty? And the truth is, yes, there are. There are some very clear scriptural guidelines for modesty. But most people don't have a clue what the word modest even means. I was at another church in a Sunday school, and uh, the pastor, I, I don't remember where we were at, but 
the pastor brought up the question. They were talking about mixed swimming. And so they began talking about the ladies wearing modest bathing suits. And they came to the conclusion that a one-piece was modest, but a bikini wasn't. Now, what scripture do you think, do you suppose that they used to come up with that distinction? They had none. Because once you leave the scriptural distinctions on modesty, you have no place to draw a line. You have really no conviction. You just have a preference for what you want to do in your life. Your heart becomes its own guide. When it comes to the word holy, when it says God is holy, what does that mean? Well, it means he's without sin. What sin? Well, God tells us a number of things that are sin in the Scripture. We have several different lists in the New Testament. But I got news for you. Lists in the Old Testament are good too. But nevertheless, in the New Testament, we have a number of lists on sin. Isn't it funny, Brother Borf, that passage on, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 through chapter 7 and verse 2, where he's talking about not committing fornication. And he says, It is good for a man not to t- touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife. The Bible is real plain. Before you get married, you're not to touch. But I got news for you. I've heard it from people that have attended Madison Baptist Church. Well, I don't see what's wrong with it. Well, duh, I don't care. God says you're not supposed to do it. That's plenty for me. But people are very bold about that. Well, you you and I just don't agree. No, your problem's not with me. You understand? You'd be better off if your problem just was with me. So I, I sit here and I'm thinking, okay, well, you face the consequences. I don't. Let me move on. Holy. What do you teach them about God? Uh, by the way, does God discipline his children? He does. Hebrews chapter 12, it's plain. Do you discipline your children? Scripturally. In the ways that God tells us to discipline our children. The book of Proverbs is a great book on disciplining children. It tells us quite clearly how to discipline children. We've got a number of verses, but that's not the subject of my message tonight. You sure don't say... Oh, you, uh, you stole that. Well, blessed be thou the Lord, my son. <laughs> what do you teach them about wrongdoing? Now, I agree. I don't think you should tell, a, tell one of your children, you're a bad boy, but you can say what you did was very bad, and now you're going to be punished because you did bad. There's a difference between those two things. Calling them a bad boy and saying what they did was bad. All right. By the way, they're born sinners. Do you know that? They're born sinners. What do you teach them about acceptable worship? It's not your heart that determines what is acceptable worship. Remember the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, who they didn't worship the Scripture according to the Scripture, didn't worship God according to the Scripture. As a matter of fact, Jesus said to her, you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Now, he didn't deny that they worship, but they didn't worship right. And he said, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in what? He didn't say in spirit and with all your heart. He says in spirit and truth. Truth. is No matter where your spirit's at, man, if it's not according to truth... It's not biblical worship. So turn to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. He says, Now I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. So good. We're good so far. What's the next word? Holy. Holy. What? Your body? He said, present your bodies. How? Holy. I could preach on that one verse, one word, all night long, but 
it would be good if some Christians would sit down and meditate on it. My body, holy. Now, when you add to that what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, for you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. He wants it to be holy to him. It's a good meditation thought as you lay in bed tonight. Think about that. But he's not done. Acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And he says, be not conformed to this world. That's culture. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You're not going to be transformed without renewing some things. We are bombarded by our culture every day of this world. You can't go to the mall without being bombarded by the culture. But the culture is wicked. Our culture murders over a million babies a year. Our culture is full of wickedness. So we've got to be transformed by the renewing of our mind so we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God because I don't want to end up doing things that are simply right in my own eyes. And in those days, there was no king in Israel. Now, you understand, going to church is not a sign of spirituality. But not going is a sign of not being spiritual. You understand what I'm saying? You can go to church and not be spiritual. But if you're spiritual, you're going to want to go to church. Just read what God says about the church in the New Testament. It's Jesus' body. It's His bride. He says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see that they're approaching. Hebrews 10, 25. Man, the emphasis in this book is not on the universal church, not at all. It's on the local assembly of believers. That's the emphasis in the Word of God. Micaiah could have bragged about worshiping Jehovah. After all, he used the name Jehovah. That was the name on his lips. But shades of Aaron who made that calf and then said, Tomorrow we're having a feast unto Jehovah. Call your God what you will, but if it's not the Jehovah of the Bible, then you're worshiping an idol. You see, a non-worshipper of Jehovah, now, he, was, he would have claimed to be a worshiper of Jehovah. He wasn't right with God. But a non-worshipper of Jehovah couldn't be right with God. Isn't that right? He had to worship the true God in order to be right with God having his own pedigreed pe preacher, didn't let him off the hook, didn't let Israel off the hook. Having given substantially for this, his sacrifice, his mother's sacrifice, didn't get him off the hook. So what do we teach our children about the Word of God? Are you teaching to do what feels right to them, what their friends do? Isn't it interesting when that priest comes along and the Danites steal him? He's got a whole tribe now in agreement with him. And they're all wrong. Right is not determined by numbers. It's determined by thus saith the Lord. Now, here's one of the things that makes it tough on a Bible-believing preacher. Because, you see, as I preach, thus saith the Lord. Some get it, some don't. Now, I think some get it, most don't. And to keep it, even that which you get, the Bible says we have to endure. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, keep, keep on themselves teaching, uh, teachers having itching ears. That makes it tough, because whereas you simply have to give account of yourself to God, a pastor has to give account of himself and those that he preached to. I'm going to tell you what, I can make my life a lot easier on planet Earth if I just stopped preaching on some things. I don't have to deny, I don't have to go back and say, no, I made a mistake. Just shut up. But the problem is, I know from this book, I've got to stand at the judgment seat of Christ 
and give an account for everybody that's heard me preach. That's not going to be a pleasant day. And whether people obey or don't obey, I want to be able to say, but I told them the truth, Lord. I told them the truth. You pray for me. Matter of fact, you pray for every Bible preacher you know because in this day and age, it's not getting easier, it's getting harder. But nevertheless, God's people are still to stand by this book. I look at this home and I say, well, that explains Samson. That explains the mess they were all in. I mean, this wasn't just... When you look at the story of Samson, it wasn't just Samson. That wasn't uh, something that was out of the ordinary. Man, the whole nation was like this. The people in the center of the nation were like this. And they saw nothing wrong with it. No wonder God had to do that to his own people. I remember back in the late 1970s, I heard Lester Roloff preach. And at that point, Lester Roloff had been put in jail three different times because he would not accept a license for his girl's home because it was under the church and ministry of the church and the state had no right to give a license to operate or not to operate a ministry of a local church. So he went to jail. And uh, he was at a place where he was suffering physically at that time. And he was preaching on some of the challenges that he had. He said, but you know, I know something. That when you're going to refine gold... The higher you turn up the heat, the more the dross comes to the top and you can scrape it off and the gold becomes more pure. He said then, we're going through some heat, but my prayer has become, Lord, turn up the heat higher. Make your church pure. You know, it's a shame we can't just be right with God according to his word, that God has to turn the heat up I don't know about you. We look at our nation today and say, wow, what a mess. Yeah. God's turning the heat up. Everybody's backing Islam because they're scared to death of it. Scared to death of it. Why are they scared to death of Islam? We've got, our God's the one who's powerful. But God's people have no fear of God or they wouldn't play with God's word like they do. So God says, okay, let me purify my church a little bit. Then I can ask some people who are serious about me again. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Dear God, do a, do a work in our hearts, I pray. I, I pray, Lord, that each of us would spend some time just going over this passage, meditating upon it, thinking about it, allowing you to change us and make us what we ought to be. I don't believe it's possible, Lord, for any of us to be too holy. But it's possible for all of us to not be holy enough. And you commanded us to be holy as the Lord our God is holy in 1 Peter chapter 1. Lord, deal with hearts. Perhaps there's some you've dealt with about some things in their lives tonight. So we're going to have an invitation. And Father, I pray that your people would simply obey what you're dealing with their heart about. But make us a people of the book again, not just of people who bring a Bible to church, but of people who allow the Bible to change our lives. And Lord, we'll thank you for all that you do in our hearts in Jesus' name. Let's stand to our feet, heads bowed, sing softly.